What up, Whiskey Ginger fans? Welcome back to the show. If it's your first time joining the show, welcome to the show. We got a good one for you today. Like my man Steve Harvey done say, it's Mike Berbiglia, the Berbigs. And he's got a special out right now called Old Man and the Pool on Netflix. Put the Go watch it, man. I love this dude. Berbigs is so funny, so smart, so witty, so quick, so sharp. Uh, very, very funny, talented comedian who does more than just uh, your tradition stand up. He is a wonderful storyteller and brings the comedy world of his life to life. Uh, Old Man in the Pool on Netflix right now. Also, uh, tonight, right here, right now, I am in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. If you're not at the show, what are you doing? Tonight in Milwaukee, tomorrow night, Chicago Theater. I think we're sold out. Come on by and wave to me from the outside. Uh, then uh, we're going to be in Minneapolis and Madison with me and Bobby Lee ending the tour uh, this year in Minneapolis and Madison. A couple tickets left in Madison, maybe. And then in the new year, we're going to Atlantic City. We're going to be in Reno, Tucson, Sacramento, Temecula, Long Beach. We're all over the place. Go to badfriendspod.com. Badfriendspod.com for those tickets. Enough rambling from me. Let's go to the episode. In here, we pour whisk, 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 whisk. You were that creature in the ginger beard. Sturdy and ginger. Like vampires, the ginger gene is a curse. Gingers are beautiful. You owe me $5 for the whiskey and $75 for the horse. Gingers are hell no. This whiskey is excellent. Ginger. I like gingers. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Whiskey Junior. My guest today is one of my favorite people on earth. I said that from my guest, but I mean it once again today. Smooth this morning. It's Mike Berbiglia! <laughs> I didn't catch any of that. You shouldn't. <laughs> and here's what we've got going on today. Uh, Mike heard a conversation with uh, me and Petey Petey Holmes about coffee. Now, look, may, could McCone, my assistant, have gotten this all wrong? Very possibly. But we wanted to test out different <laughs> versions of the coffee because uh, Berbiglia, Berbiglia will tell you there was a discrepancy over three shots, three shots versus two, two shots. shots. Yes, yes, exactly. In, in a small cup. In a small cup. So let's see what we've got here. What did you get him now? Uh, let's explain. There is there's cappuccino there, right? The reason, and by the way, the reason why I care about this is I love the pete holmes episode and you guys go pretty deep on coffee we get yeah and i was like literally like i could watch them talk about coffee for three hours <laughs> you know who's that tom papa's the same way papa is a yeah and this is my regular coffee right <clears throat> yep. all right so here we go so this is so what's the tall what do we got the big one what what's is this? that i think see this i told oh, you he messed it up. oh I, I hate this what did i say because that's the one that has too much milk yeah i told you he messed it up and i knew it i said medium for all of them no 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 I no no said uh. for mine now see, now see, see, and see. This is the thing. My, this my, is the only one that's going to be correct. That I will think, be correct because it's smallest. But cup. let's taste it last then. How okay, okay, okay. Let's g- taste the first one and see how terrible this, this is. Ridiculous one. Yeah, let's see the ridiculous well, the, one. Flat white was. When I said good flat white, they were like, who was there? Who was there? Uh, it was a, it was a, it was a brunette girl. I don't know. The little tiny skinny one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Okay. She's a little new. You know what's so funny is she's a little new, and if the owner was there, <laughs> they would have been bumped. Yeah. Okay, so right, this is the. For whatever reason, tall cappuccino. Let's see the tall. Let's see super tall cap. It's not bad. It's three shots. Yeah, yeah. It's not bad. I t- you know what's so funny? Yeah, yeah. I, it's still because their coffee's really good. So I go. Even a bad yeah. pour will still taste good, even though it's the numbers are wrong. I wanted to slam it, but it was. It, Can't it, do it's it. got a nice taste. Well, you know what this is. You, I don't know how you feel. Uh, you, you know Jay Larson. You know Jay. Larson. Oh yeah, yeah. Jay Larson is a self-proclaimed expert of Arnold Palmer's. Is he? Well, he loves the mix. He loves a perfect okay. mix of Arnold Palmer, as he says. Yeah, his, and his accent. He knows extreme. the he says he's got like the right numbers down. I remember we were talking about this one time. And even if the numbers are a little off, if the iced tea is really good, yeah. And the lemonade is really good, you can excuse it. This might be that kind of excuse, right? Yeah, yeah. I think the coffee all right, let's Should try. Should we say what the coffee let's... is? Priscilla's. Oh yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I love Priscilla's. Priscilla's. I've, I've yeah. been a long, a long fan of the Big P. Yeah. So All whatever, right. whatever they're doing, I think that that. Now let's see the cap. Tell me what the cap tastes okay. like. So this is this is their regular cap. Here's you on the flight it, home, by the way, just just gripping the seat, breaking it. No, I'm like I heard Seinfeld talk about this once. I'm unlimited coffee. Oh, you can do all day. Pretty much, I can do four or five coffees in a day. Okay, so my limit is always I've limited myself to. Well, I, that's a lie. One to two in the morning, and then one in the afternoon, and that's oh, max out. I'm max wow, out. Good for you. I mean, only because for years I was doing as much as I wanted all the time. Yeah. And then at night I would be um, not caffeine buzzing, but just like 
uh, anxiety stiff. Yeah, I get like, you. I get you. I just be kind of spaced out, anxiety stiff. Like oh, I should get rid of this stuff in my body. No, it's- I get that. Well, it's funny because P.D. Holmes, our our mutual friend, our buddy. I, I, w- I did my show, The Old Man in the Pool, which is now a comedy special. Which is now available. Good transition. <laughs> the Old Man in the Pool is about out right now. You can go watch it as we speak. When this episode is live, the special will be out. and You can go see it. Uh, I want to talk about that, but go ahead. Yeah, so ahead. I, and when I was in London doing it, I did it in the West End for like four or five weeks, and it was hard to be away from my family. I got really depressed. They never came. They came at the end. For yeah. the, it, it was tough. My daughter's first day of third grade was the same day as my first day of my show ah, it was brutal yeah and it was like one of those things show business sometimes like the we don't have the theater for that's the only date we have you know you go okay i gotta do this i was depressed really depressed i mean pete i said to pd on the phone i go i'm rock bottom yeah like and he, i don't think he's ever heard me even say that and this is genuine this isn't like one of those uh man i'm really bummed about this like yes. this is like no i i i this is a life moment or yeah. I'm gonna regret it or be hurt by it. Yeah, and I was I was really down, and uh, and he said I think you gotta listen to the Power of Now, the audio book, mm-hmm. which is, uh, um, Jimmy Tolle. Yeah, yeah, Tolle, Eckhart Tolle, yeah. Eckhart Tolle. Yeah. yeah, and it really helped me. I mean, I have to say, really helped it me. It did. Yeah, and it's, <clears throat> I think the reason is sorry. This circles back to what we were talking about a second ago, is. As comedians, you know, whatever it is, you're saying you're, you know, you're, you're having anxiety. For me, it's as comedians, it's like our job is literally to use our mind to take apart things all the time, to dissect yeah. coffee, to, to dissect the sandwich place, the, to, to dissect your relationships. And we get very good at it if we're any good. And the, my problem is, I think a lot of comedians' problem, we can't shut it off. Yeah. And so the Eckhart Tolle book is all about uh, separating your mind from your consciousness and seeing your mind as a tool for your consciousness and not your consciousness itself. Right. So that was, that was helpful. The division makes it a little bit easier. You still exist in that space, but it it's the same thing I go through with this. I've talked about it on this, like uh, I have this – this terrible back injury that's caused crazy pain and the pain i talk about neuroplastic pain is the thing that's a real term in the medical field meaning like um you know what uh phantom limbs are you yeah. know what that is right sure yeah so phantom limb is what they would call you're an amputee and you yeah. think you still have an arm you do not yeah it's all neuroplastic yeah. meaning like your brain is still firing these weird crazy signals with the assumption that it is there because yeah. the pain was so tremendously traumatic yeah and this this what helps these exercises I do, they help some of my actual pain um, subside a little bit, but it also helps the neuroplastic pain kind of disappear a little bit. The pain is still real, but the... the so what do you do to to do that? Well, I mean, there's a, a litany of things. Okay, honestly, okay. a lot of breathing exercises are a big part of it and stretching and doing like yoga, yeah. but also like it's a lot of meditation. It's weird. Yeah. A lot of it is brain heavy focus. So what, he, what you're saying in The Power of Now is once you learn to divide these two things and really kind of separate um, that all-consuming uh, thought, anxiety, consciousness. And if you can kind of peel those in two separate sectors, it makes it a little bit easier for you to handle, right? Yeah. When everything is at once, it's kind of like if you looked at a calendar and you saw all the things you had to do for the day, Yeah. you kind of want to lose it. Yeah. But if you were like, if I can just No, I, do I, that, need, I need to make lists. Yeah, otherwise you're... <clears throat> I just fall down an anxiety hole, you know? I find that I fall down an anxiety hole. I even get, with my podcast, I don't know if you have it with this podcast, which when you're in New York, I'd love to have you on. Yeah, I'm coming in a month. Oh, great. Come on, working it out. Um, I get anxious before the recording. Yeah, I do. Oh, you do? Yeah, but it's also, but it's anxious because I want to see the guest there. The anxiety gap is the same I have before I go on stage when I'm like, I just really want to get this going. Yep. I just want to like start the engine. Yeah. If that that lull before is the most nauseating. Yeah. Every athlete I've ever spoken to, by the way, yeah. feels the exact same way. Oh, interesting. Now, you talk to any like performer, any anyone that has to perform live, yeah. sport, comedy, whatever that is. Yeah. Uh, that lull is the most. Uh, that's the most anxiety inducing. Where you're like waiting for the thing to start. Then once it starts, you know the moment you set foot on stage. It's almost like you take a breath. It's almost like it feels like relief. It's much easier. You're like, there you are. Like <laughs> they're all there. It's so weird how 
people, I think fans alike assume, are you ever like nervous before the set? And it's like, not nervous. I just, I really would like to get it going. Yeah. I just want to start. Let's see so this cappuccino, this. by okay. the way. Gold. It's gold. Yeah, yeah. It's gold. He likes it. Yeah, see? <laughs> Look at his smile. I like. Way to go, McCone. Way to go. Even the big pour was not bad. That wasn't bad. This is great. This is a, it's a delicious little, you know, this is making my whole trip. The only thing that would make it better. I'm not even kidding. You know what would make it better? In a real cup. That's the only difference. Really? The paper cups are nice, but when you drink it locally there in no, a I think real right. cup, it's just. I think just, you're right. No, I'm a big real cup guy. Real cup. It does I like, I like a it. nice ceramic mug. Mm. Oh, love and it. You know, I like the discomfort of a small cappuccino cup. I think it's funny that it's so tiny. <laughs> I like that it fits oddly in my fingers. That it's. Yes. It's like as an American, we have everything that's easily grippable. Like, look at this. They designed a bottle of whiskey so you can hold the sides. I like that they have little cappuccino cups. They're not made for hand yeah. fitting. This How is, is this? no good. Also good. Not good. Not good. Not good. This one's no good. This is third place. What is this? What is that? Just re regular like, iced coffee with regular milk. Yeah, that's been sitting. It's just not. It's just not kind of a, not anything. I mean, I've... I've been on the road as a comic for like twenty five years, so it's like I'll do rest stop coffee. Like I'll like sure. I'll do it if I have to do it. Yeah, you have to. At some um, point, so you I've have seen to. the spectrum. Uh huh. You've done it all. But once you taste something like this, you just go. Oh, it's over. That's what you're craving it all the time. Yeah, it's. Because I don't do drugs. I don't drink a lot. I'm like, you know. You never did drugs. Never did hard drugs. No. Not the. Good, I mean, not I the do. Goods. It's funny. Like I'm working out my new hour right now, and. A lot of the things that I'm ruminating on are having to do with like I have an eight year old daughter, and how like when I was like, when I was like, like I'm seeing the world through her eyes, and I'm remembering that like when I was a kid, I thought grown ups knew everything, and mm. now I'm a 45 year old man. Like we don't know anything. No, we're faking it. <laughs> yeah. All of us are pretending all the time. Right. So like for example, with drugs, it's like uh, you know, at some point I'm gonna have to be like, so don't do drugs, but but then like also like but I do you know, I take clonopin for my sleepwalking, <laughs> which is it's not a drug per se, it's a drug, you know what I mean? Yeah, and then it, yeah. <clears throat> classifying the levels of drugs that are appropriate is very funny to your kid. She's like, well, why is that better? Your, your kid's so intelligent. She's like, why is that better than psychedelics? You're like, I, well, I, I, don't, I know. don't know. I can't explain it. There's so many things I don't know. Like, it's, yeah. it's the thing that I've, I've realized in adulthood is like, is like that in every, I feel like in every relationship, there should be a, a, one of the people should know how electricity and plumbing <laughs> and, uh, you know, heating works. <laughs> And we don't have that. Yeah. And and so now we're like looking for a third <laughs> in, in a in our thruple, you know, because like we need a husband. Yeah. You know, we, we don't really have do. a husband. Yeah, we really do. Yeah. And we need to zap him back from 1958. That's the thing. Can oh, we absolutely. Get that guy here, because that guy would be able to level us out. A it is funny. I bet you. I bet you. 50 years or 60 years ago. Uh, both the husband and the wife, or the couple living in the home, almost yeah. always knew all the things. I think they both knew the things. They knew how to. They knew what yes. kind of the things, how to do it, how they worked. And well, your father's replacing uh, one of the generator, but he they they know. Yeah. And now it started to separate. Now at the same time, the bottom dropped out. Now neither me or my wife know anything. Yeah. Like here's what happened yesterday. The plumber came because a pipe was leaking that they had originally fixed. Yeah. So he said, "We'll put the new version on because I think." I know what happened. He shows up, and my wife says, do you want to ask him about the leaky guest toilet in the hallway? Because I went and bought a new pump thing. I said, I can do it. I can do this. I know exactly how to fix that pump inside the toilet. Oh, you do? Toilet. Well, just from trial and error. Okay. And she said, but you haven't done it yet. And she's right. <laughs> and she's very right. And, yeah, and because yeah, yeah. my fear is I'm going to break it more, and then I'll really have an issue. So I said... Well, I've got to go uh, ask him if this is the right mechanism for it, for yeah. the new pump, because I think the old air pump wasn't filtering right. Yeah. And I leave. I go run an air, and I come home, and she goes, did you try the toilet in the hallway? Yeah. I said, it's fixed? I, I well, Yeah. Oh, awesome. So did he, was it, and I look down right next to the sink is still the old packaging with the pump inside with the receipt on top of it to return it. I said, he didn't even switch it out. She goes, it was just the chain. The chain wasn't the right length inside for the flapper and i was like that's it 
That yeah. was it. That's embarrassing. And right, uh, you I, should be. That's that's your level. Yeah, I should have known Chain. Right, but I saw Chain look fine. It's Kate, so funny Kate, you man. describing Chain fine. you describing your wife, mm-hmm. your wife saying like, "But did you?" Did, did but did you do it? You didn't I, do it. I, I love that because Gaffigan and I were talking about how we all there's a healthy fear one has of one's wife or husband. Sure, yeah, of because course. Because that person has the power to crush you. Oh yeah. with their words. Oh, because they know your. They know everything. They know your little hurt <laughs> they points. Know, yeah, they know the hurt points. <laughs> yeah. They know where the bodies are buried. Right. And right. it's like, right. and it's it, it's a crazy power. It's really kind of fascinating. When do they use it? When, when do, do they, they use it? it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How long have you been married? Seven. Seven. I'm 15. Yeah. Oh, she's used it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, we're so deep in. We've been together almost 20 years, and so we've been married for 15 years. We have a child together. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's wild. It's- Has she ever had a moment in your relationship where uh, where she kind of call- not only called you on your own shit, but did it in a way that kind of restructured the way your relationship works, you know? I think so. I, it's funny because she's, you know, the Old Man in the Pool is my new special, and it's all about life and death and mortality. And kind of like, honestly, it's like about, I reference, for example, like the Warren Zevon famous interview with Letterman. Do you remember it? Do I remember it? <clears throat> yeah. Do I remember it? He knows. I watched that thing. I've watched it to death. Dude, this is going to, I'm going to kiss you on your forehead. <laughs> Yesterday, I said this to someone. Someone goes, I love this song. I've never heard that. Oh, Bobby. Bobby never heard, um, there was a song that came out uh, on wherever we were, we were in a restaurant, and I go, wow, yeah, what a fucking, what a playlist, because it was, um, uh, uh, it was, uh, was it Warren Zevon? Yes, and it, w- it was from Handsome Boy, uh, it, Handsome Boy, Handsome Boy. I don't know. Excitable Boy. Excitable boy. <clears throat> and it was, um, uh, hold on, I do want to find it, because I just like it so much, it's, um, <sighs> Do you keep in this part? Yeah, we leave this in because it's unfortunate yeah. for me. Yeah, because I look stupid. Anyway, <laughs> he goes, who is it? I said, that's Warren Zevon. You don't know who that is? Yeah. And he goes, no. And I said, Bob, you have to go home right now and go watch him and Letterman talk about his diagnosis. Was this Bobby Lee? Yeah. Bob? Oh, yeah. Okay, you call him Bob. Yeah, okay, Bob. Yeah, 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 okay. And I said, you have to watch his diagnosis, essentially, to, uh, to America. Unbelievable. And for, for fans that don't know Warren Zevon, uh, he basically he was very close to Letterman, and he said, in his final days, he was going to do one of his last performances on there. And that, honestly, that gets me. Yeah, he says, enjoy every sandwich. Enjoy every fucking so sandwich. So Letterman says to him, L- experiencing this the way you are, you're facing down your, your end of your life, what, what have you learned? What can you teach us? He says, enjoy every sandwich. And sometimes Jenny will say, to answer your question, she'll go, you should watch your own show. Oh, that's Because funny. the show is all about living in the moment and yeah. experiencing it. And she's right. And whenever she says, I go, I go, you're right, but. Um, no, but. It's an everyday. But she's right. <clears throat> she's right. It sucks because I know we take these cliches for granted when someone's like, enjoy. Th- those things kind of come and they go. But I think the more we hear them, like the more we hear them from our yeah. significant others or our good friends. Like Pete does that with me. Me and Pete check yes. each other down all the time. Yeah. I think the more you hear it from someone you care about, the more you do get to actually enjoy the sandwich. Seinfeld had a quote that I heard the other day that made me laugh very passively. I don't know what the interview was, but he goes, um, in that very, you know, when Seinfeld is doing his like, that he's up here and he's at the very top. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it's like the last of the, he goes, um, and I won't scream it like him, but he said, the guy that gets to heaven with the lowest mileage on his Porsche loses. Yeah. And I was like, that's so funny. That is, oh, that's nice. In a very Seinfeldian way. Yeah, he's saying, you don't get to enjoy the thing you made? What a fucking bummer. What a well, the, bummer. <clears throat> the other thing Seinfeld said in one of these interviews, and I don't even really know Seinfeld. I, he's one of the few comedians who I actually have never, never really met, had never a met, conversation with. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I've, see, I've seen him here and there in New York. But, like, there's an interview where he goes, he goes, you know, j- your job is to, a type of torture i'm paraphrasing and, yeah and he goes and if you can get a job where it's like the least amount of torture and you enjoy the torture uh-huh. then you you win yeah yeah and i, I enjoy think the torture. i think that yeah, i do too yeah 
It's actually very calming for me to hear him say that. I'm like, yes, that's yeah. right. I got to do my dream job. I'm a comedian. I make these shows. I make these specials. I make movies. It's so hard. Yeah, I have so much anxiety to to go back to what we were talking about earlier. I experience anxiety all the time, uh-huh. but also I I love it. And you know, I in my last special, which was called the new one, about having a child, even though like I never wanted to have a child, I talk about how um, in, if you're lucky in your life, there are moments where you feel like there's a where things make sense and you feel joy there's moments of joy like yeah. joy can't be a constant no miserable <clears throat> so miserable yeah i talked about the book some you know the book some i never That's, read that no oh it's great man and it basically says that it's like you couldn't have all of these if you were given the option in the afterlife to experience a thousand years of sadness yeah and then um a thousand years of happiness followed right after consecutively yeah would you rather have that or the way that you've lived and you'd say well i'd rather have a sad day than a good day yeah. instead of a thousand years of hurt and it's like yeah well then this is it don't you yeah. understand like, yeah the balance is going to be uh what it is you can't control when these things go up and down but the beauty is that they do go up and down that's why i like you know i did it this morning at my hotel it's like i i was feeling a little down and i write in my journal when First re- thing when you wake up? Yeah. Yeah. I try to do no phone, no no technology, um, right before I can, you know, think anything. And I literally, I say, that, this is a line from my special where I go, like, I go, you know, I feel, I find if you write down what you're saddest about or angriest about, you can start to see your own life as a story. And when you see your own life as a story, you, you can start to zoom out and encourage the main character to make better decisions. And I feel like that's, and it was true, yeah, I mean, I, I this morning I was feeling kind of down. I wrote in my journal. I wrote about what I'm upset about, and then I'm like, yeah, things are good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you open the curtains to your nice hotel. <laughs> things are okay. <laughs> Get me coffee. Yeah. <laughs> in here, we pour whiskey. whiskey. This episode of Whiskey Ginger is brought to you by Rabbit Hole Distillery and their one of a kind Kentucky bourbon and rye whiskeys behind Rabbit Hole is uh, an award-winning spirits, baby. It's all led by their founder, Kaveh Zamanian. He left a 20-plus successful uh, year career as a clinical psychologist and went down the rabbit hole with a mission to create the world's finest spirits. And boy, oh boy, did he. He was just inducted into the Kentucky Bourbon Hall of Fame, the fastest ever to get inducted. Fastest ever in, Kaveh. Shout out, my guy. Um, they have four different expressions. Uh, they're small batch, which is why I really like these guys. I've talked about them for a long time on this show. Um, I've been sipping sapping on this Derringer, uh, which is the straight bourbon finished in uh, PX Sherry Casks. Pedro Jimenez Sherry Casks. Really, really sweet. Very delicious. Very good. A soft sipping afternoon sauce, if you will. Uh, but they have four They have uh, four total expressions, and all of them are delicious. You know, their Cave Hill is their uh, four-grain triple malt bourbon. Boxer Grail is that rye, which I've talked about on this show that I do love. Not a huge rye guy, but I do love theirs. Um, and the high rye gold is uh, that high gold. And then, of course, this delicious Derringer sauce. I think the thing is a lot of these guys say that they're small bats. They're not, and they, they, they promote toasted barrels uh, and chard, but they're not. These guys have under 15 barrels at a time. That is extremely small batch. Um, and they're they're pulling every drop is going to taste as consistent and, and, and as same as uh, any other bottle that anybody would get all across this beautiful land. So if you're looking for something new to sip sap on, uh, I got to tell you, try one of these four expressions. If you're looking for something uh, in the evening before you tossed off into dreamland, I love the Derringer as a little nightcap before your head hits your pillow. They got four distinct whiskey expressions. Today, that's the one I like. Go to rabbitholedistillery.com slash buy now. Use promo code rabbit for $5 off your first order. Rabbitholedistillery.com slash buy now. Promo code rabbit, five bucks off your first order. Please drink responsibly. Ginger. I like gingers. No, it is true that you, I think if you, especially because, look, and I want to talk about the special because it's it's pertinent in, in my world because when you talk about your father, uh, by the way, it is such a good piece that's circling through the internet about, you know, your father at 56 and his father at 56 yeah. as well. And it, I think a lot of people experience something with their father with death that boys especially where you're like, man, am I going to be just like my dad? Yeah. A- in a million different ways. You know, I feel it more by the day. You Like, am I going to be exactly like my yeah. dad? And for me, it connected me when you said, when you say that because my fear was always not turning out you know, my father struggled with addiction. Yeah. So 
I was always scared of that. Yeah. And he's made himself a, a more whole man years later. But that was always this looming thing that I tried to avoid. But in, in an effort to avoid that, you know, I would have other habits that were worse where it was like my quickness to get angry. Yes. Or, you know what I mean? And I so, have that. Right. When you, when you avoid... So I guess my question for you is like knowing your father's, you know, path, right? yeah. when you, would you, which you joke about so eloquently but when you say I should just take that whole year off. <laughs> yeah, and it's yeah. like... When, my, when I turn 56, well, right, because exactly. my dad had a heart attack at 56, his dad his had dad. a heart attack at 56. And so you yeah, should take the year. Take the year off so, when I turn 56, yeah. But in that, what I really saw through that was, was do you, as a man that's going through the, this life now as you're becoming a father of your own, are you trying to do all the things your father didn't do? Are you trying to kind of yeah. not go that route? Yeah. Well, I feel like I what I've experienced is through my teens and 20s, and honestly, arguably what got me into comedy in the first place is this massive attempt to reverse, you know, not be my dad. And yeah. you know, my dad was a doctor, and I'm going to go ro- com- be a road comic. <laughs> it was just like, he didn't want me to do it at all. Of course you so, know, yeah. he, he had no, it, it's, uh, he was like, what are you doing? Like, I mean, he was, he was pretty. He was actually quite angry in my twenties when I moved to New York to become a comedian. He was. He was very angry. My brother Joe, who I, you know I collaborate with a lot on writing, like really had to talk my parents down from the ledge. Beyond um, this disappointment, was it disowning? Was it like I don't? No, really no, talk no. To you? I don't no. think they're. I don't. They would never. They, I don't think that that's in their their DNA. You're not the child of an immigrant. No, no. Because they no. just disown their children. It's like you know Fahim Anwar. He talks about that. It's like the moment he told his father he was gonna wanted to be a comedian his dad was like well that's it for us <laughs> like, i don't know if i need to- <laughs> that's it for us you know it's that idea of like uh, oh so you're oh so we're not cool anymore it's like no right. no, no no i just i want to try something i want to try the closest i ever came to that was was without going into detail some political conversations in the last 10 years well yeah that's pretty always gonna, pretty, yeah that's guns out those those were pretty hard <laughs> Yeah, I used to poke the bear with my dad because my mom loved how much it pissed him. Oh my like, gosh! My mom would laugh, and she's like, "Don't, come, don't do it." But I would make such obvious, heavy-handed jokes that were slighting him. Yeah, and he would get so fucking mad. But it was so funny to watch him do that. Like, I just, mm. I love to bait him. I don't do it anymore. But, but sorry to get, but yeah, to get back to the so I so yeah, in a way, like, like I grew up in Massachusetts, Irish Catholic town. Yeah, you know. Uh, Shrewsbury and Central Mass and it was and it was like I said this like in my first solo show Sleepwalk with me years ago but like growing up like the thing you'd hear from people a lot was like just like don't tell anyone you know and it's like and of course like you know Catholic Church like that's clearly like went yeah. a little too far with uh, the don't tell stuff yeah. yeah that was their whole thing well yeah that's one of my jokes is like from one of my first specials is i was an altar boy as a kid and the answer is no no yeah i wasn't i think it's because <laughs> right. they I knew i was that. a talker but like <laughs> the but like it really it did uh infuse with all of the culture of growing up is people just didn't open up about stuff no and so i ended up being this comedian who's kind of confessional like i tell the things that i'm embarrassed about i think i'm are stu or ridiculous about me right and are embarrassing and i don't even want to say pd holmes and i always talk about this if you're not talking about the things that are your secrets, and it's like, what are we even talking about? Right, what are we talking what about? Are, why are we here? Right, right. You know what I mean? Someone's got to open up that door. Yeah, and so that's how, yeah, that's how I ended up, yeah, being a comic. I don't I don't know how the hell we ended up in this in this conversation. We're going to keep it, doing it, trust Okay, me. okay. Shrewsbury Mass, by the yeah. way. Yeah. What a name. It's like it's built to be a quaint town, Shrewsbury. No, and it was, it was, it's a great, it's a great little town. I actually went there recently. They were doing like a, uh, a, Peacock was doing like a little documentary about my comedy, and 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 I, we went back to my childhood home and everything. Are you the are you the pride of Shrewsbury? One of these apparently, things? I, yeah. I didn't think I was. Has I anybody thought... else come from there? <clears throat> no, no, it's I, you. <laughs> there's not a lot. It's there's you. down the street was the birth control pill. They they invented it down, what? down the street from where I grew up at the All Worcester right. Foundation. But it's but Way there's to go a, Shrewsbury. It's a weird connection though, because I ended up with bladder cancer when I was twenty, and literally like the I've never said this in anything. 
literally the doctor goes like, this is really unusual. People who are 20 years old. They took out this tumor and it was, it was malignant and all this stuff. He goes, do you, do you, have you worked with toxic paints or have you been around like a, a lab of any kind? You know, it's Whoa. like literally down the street. It is. And so then, yeah, and a lot, and a bunch of people in our neighborhood ended up with cancer. And oh. I know it's a lot. I know it's a lot. This episode of Whiskey Dinner brought to you by. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, no, there's not a ton of like well known people out of Shrewsbury, but yeah, it is a quaint little town. Yeah. Town. You reminded me, by the way, before I get back to that, is uh, there's a documentary called The Devil We Know, and that's about the invention of Teflon and what that did to the town. And if you haven't seen that, people at home, my God, will it shock your core what Teflon did to like this, to local people wow. who are like, why does everybody have weird cancer oh, down this, in this neighborhood from this factory? And then, skip forward real fast, interesting fact, Teflon, Teflon is being found in, in blood from everyone around the oh, world. Oh, I can't take it. Dating back to the Korean oh, War. Oh, I can't even take it. Did you watch Chernobyl? Oh, t- come on. Chernobyl, come Craig on. Mason's series is... A masterwork. It's unreal, but it's it's devastating. Yeah, it's in, awful. In relation it's to awful. that, back to Shrewsbury. <laughs> <laughs> Shrewsbury is no Chernobyl. No, 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 no. It's just it's bladder cancer. What are you gonna do? <laughs> but when you left and your old man is a doctor, yeah, and you go to the city, what was the? There had to have been a point when he was like, "Man, this this kid has definitely got a thing." You mean was I, there I'm a any switch? Good? No, was there just a switch for your father that was like, "I think he should." continue on in the oh path. i think when i did letterman i did letterman young so yeah. it was like i did it when i was 24 holy shit and and it was you a, had to have been one of the youngest to do letterman then right yeah so the, i think it was me and i think Chappelle did it when he was like 19 i, I do mean, remember that yeah bobcat maybe did it when he was 20 something like that right and i, I don't think there's many other folks who did no. it and that's uh, young and it wasn't it didn't go over well with the other comics i will say oh they were pissed because you got it yeah huh? yeah Fuck that guy. <laughs> what does he do that I don't do? That's how it always is at that level. It's like, oh, that guy got that guy yeah. got tonight, Joe? Oh, yeah. okay. Why? Who does he know? Took does he like, know someone? It took me like 10 years to live that down. That like sucks. now, like you have the store yeah. and we have the seller yeah. in New York, right? And they're and they're kind of a one for one in a certain way. Yeah. And I love the seller. I love the comics at the seller. But what's so funny is like you know, I see, I meet all these younger comics and they're great. And it's like, they have no idea. I'll tell them stories. I'll be like, I used to be slashed limb for limb yeah. by Patrice O'Neill and Bill Burr Colin, and all Colin, guys. all those guys. I mean, it was merciless. Like, yeah. they don't even give a grasp how mean people were to me. Yeah. I mean, it was, be- and it was because of that. I got Letterman when I was a kid. Success is, uh, it puts a big target on your back. But then weirdly, Todd Glass told me this once. Uh, which I, I love Todd. You and know? can you do it like Todd does it? Can you say it, can you say it like he said it? <laughs> he, sure. Let me tell you about. Nah, I don't know. Like, <laughs> no. Let me tell you about David Spade. No, David Spade. No, it's. Uh, the, <laughs> I'm not impressed. Dude, he, but he's so. He is. Todd is very no, like. No. 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 <laughs> stop. No, stop. This is important. Mike, this has no, th- I know you're making the you're breezing past this. This is important. David Spade, you know. <laughs> That's the, very good. <laughs> the, this, this intonation he has, every single word is so big. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. He gets bigger and then goes smaller. Yeah. He, I love Todd Glass. Me too. He's I, fantastic. He was one of the first I opened for him when I was a, a door person at the Washington, D.C. improv when I was in college. And he's one of the most influential comedians on my whole career. Yeah, he's such a magician, man. He's so fun to watch. But, he's, but he transforms. He said this thing to me once, though, because pe- he came to New York, and it was like Todd Lynn, who had passed, and uh, and Patrice, who had passed, who's now passed. They were both going into me hard, and Todd was just in town, and he's just like, "What is happening? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Why? <laughs> Why are you guys doing this to this guy?" And Todd, and Todd walked out with me, and, he, and Todd was just like. Why did they do that? I was like, I don't know, man. That's just what's like around here. You know? That's so brutal. <laughs> and 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 he goes, and he said to me, he goes, David Spade, when he came to LA, that's what people were like to him. Yeah. And then he goes, it goes away when you get older. 
-hmm. like when David became like 35, 40, whatever, because people realize you're sticking around. Yeah. And it's working, by the way. It's not like yeah. you didn't get one thing. It's not like you got Letterman and then no one saw you do anything ever again. Yeah. It was like it was working. So uh, there's only so much you can say at some point before somebody goes, yeah, he's good. He's doing it. I mean, it's, yeah. I, the jealousy thing is what's weird about the youth in our profession is like you're, you you want it so bad and you want it for your friends, but you also kind of are like, fuck that guy. Well, yeah, I made, a, I made a whole movie about it. Don't think twice. Yeah. It's all about like a group of best friends and an improv group. It's a great group. movie. Oh, thanks, man. It's a very, very good I, movie. I wasn't begging for a compliment, but no, like, no. I, it's a great movie. It, it's, a, but, uh, it's something I was, I'm obsessed with. Or, like this idea of a group of best friends in an improv group. And who gets One of them SNL. gets SNL. Yeah. SNL. Right, what, what was it Weekend called Live. Weekend, Weekend Live. Weekend Live, that's right. Weekend Keegan Live. Michael Key gets yeah. Weekend Live, and, uh, and, and the rest of the friends don't. And it's about what happens in friendships when people realize that life isn't fair. I mean, because it's not. No. <laughs> and, 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 and how could you expect it? You weren't all going to get it. No! Yeah, you knew someone would maybe get it, but all well, of you know. What's wild is that movie cured me of being uh, jealous. I used to be much more jealous. Yeah. When I was younger... 20s, even in my even in the 30s. How come that person got that and I didn't get it? And at a certain point, you go, it's all like some version of luck and hard work and talent. It's like talent's the cost of admission to even be in the conversation. People yeah. who are sometimes when people are like, but I'm talented, it's like, all right. Yeah. A lot of, Let me tell got you. A lot, got a lot of those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot of people are talented, man. <laughs> but then it's like it's like it's like it's like talent. A lot of people have it. Hard work, it drops off. It gets big a little big time drop. Gets a little, yeah, big drop, big drop, big drop, big drop. Right there. <laughs> that hard work hill is real, <laughs> real big. And then people, people don't want to do the burpees. Uh uh-uh. uh Sit ups. <laughs> yeah, man, that's how you get them. No, but then and then after that, it's and then it's luck. I think it's luck. Yeah. Then it's uh, the universe or whatever you want to call it, whatever word you like to insert for. The universe, yeah, luck or yeah. happenstance or blessing or, pr- you know what I mean? Whatever slides hashtag you into blessed. that. Hashtag blessed. I go blessed. hashtag blessed always. Blessing, 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 blessing. <laughs> I feel like whatever the universe kind of like is, I think the universe is constantly throwing things up and around and it's almost like sometimes it hits you. Again, yeah. not to go back to Seinfeld for no reason, but yeah. he did, a lot of wisdom. he said that in, in another interview about, he goes, I'd be, I'd be, and I'm paraphrasing, but I'd be foolish to think that uh, I did all of that, Seinfeld. He's like, if the, the casting was perfect, the things they kind of just, it was on Letterman, or I mean on, uh, sorry, on um, on Stern. He was saying how like all of these things slotted right. Like to get all these actors to push into the same thing, he's yeah. like, what do you think that, I don't think that was luck. There's a yeah. lot of luck going on there. I'll tell you a funny thing that just makes me think of, it. he also never told us that I think, um, in the middle of like pandemic, Larry David calls me. Don't know him. How do you just got your Don't number? Don't know him. Call my number. Call love me. this. I love when this happens. I've never had a guy not have my number call me. I like this. <laughs> I want this so bad to happen to me. Calls me. He goes, I've been listening to these albums. These are great. Great job. You know, it was like, this is a dream. Wow. <laughs> like, this is literally a dream. He's like, wow. Mike, these are great. I'm like, this is a bit. Yeah, yeah. Someone is Pete Holmes doing Larry <laughs> right. David? Right, right. This is bananas. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, literally, I go, Larry, I go, this is like literally my dream come true. And then I made the fatal mistake of going, would you ever come on oh my podcast? My I got to go. Yeah, immediately. He goes, he said the best thing about podcasts. He goes, no, there's no upside. <laughs> What's the upside? Yeah, for him. You know, I can only say the wrong thing. <laughs> people get mad because people already watch my things. <laughs> He's right. What is the upside for Larry David? It's yeah. such an awkward thing with the podcast because yeah. you go like, you know, hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of people listen to this thing and yeah. you're talking to someone and you can't, and you're thinking, Oh, that would be good, actually, if they came on. But it's like, the moment you bring it up, there's just a... They have to ask you. They would. They have to want... I to, asked you to come on here. Yeah, That's yeah. the way it has I to work. I want you to want to do it. Yes. Because it's hard when you ask people to want to do it. Uh, Neil Brennan always says this quote to me all the time. He always says, 
you can't ask someone to do your dishes. And like, <laughs> that's what it is. He's like, you're just begging people, will you do the dishes? And it's like, he's, I didn't even make that mess. I don't want to do those fucking things. Yeah. So I, he's like, that is a metaphor for when you're asking people to go out of their way to take time to do a thing that's just for you. He's like, it has to be for both parties. It to has like to be want, mutually. Yeah, to want to do a thing. Mutually And helpful. why would Larry want to do anything? Oh, my God. Anything? What am I, and then what am I even doing asking him that? I, I, I didn't No, but make, it's wonderful. I didn't make that mistake again. In here, we pour whiskey. whiskey. Here to tell you about Aura Frames, my friends. The perfect present doesn't always have to be difficult to find. Digital picture frame from Aura Frames is thoughtful, meaningful, perfect for pretty much everybody. I love this. It's such a great gift. I gave one to mi mama and mi padre and one to my sweet, sweet lady so she can have pictures of just me doing different smiley expressions first thing in the morning right next to her bed and her bedside table. Uh, look, old traditional picture frames out. We don't want to see the same photo every time I walk into the hallway. Digital picture frames are so cool. You can change them at random. Uh, you know, you got a guest coming over you haven't talked in a long time. Put a couple pictures up of him or her. Let them know how much you really love them. Be like, dude, that's always like that. We always have rotating photos of you and your family. I find it hard to shop for people sometimes. At a certain age, you run out of gifts. Uh, a digital picture frame encapsulates uh, everything for everyone because who doesn't love a photo? Look at your phone. How many photos you got in there? They just sit in there. Why not put them in a digital picture frame? Come on, man. So very easy to do. Uh, so user-friendly, so beautiful, so cool. And it's a unique gift. It's not the same old, same old. Don't get anybody's socks this year. From now through Black Friday and Cyber Monday, Aura's having their best deal of the year. Listeners can save $40 off on their best-selling Carver matte frame by visiting AuraFrames.com slash whiskey. That's Aura, A-U-R-A, frames.com slash whiskey. Use the promo code whiskey to save $40 off their best-selling frames. Go get them right now. Terms and conditions apply. Hey, hey, here to tell you about Lucy. Lucy makes tobacco free. Nicotine for people to focus better, think deeper, chill out smoother, and inspire creativity. All right? This stuff is great. I love throwing a little pouch in the lip, little lipper, little upper decker lipper. Uh, nicotine uh, increased alertness, attention, and mood. It's been proven, baby. Focus better, think deeper, inspire your creativity, and also relax. Cool down, calm down, and chill out. Lucy, how is it different than all these other nicotine pouches that you've seen on the market? 100% pure tobacco-free nicotine. That's right. You're never going to find any tobacco products in any of their products ever. The pouches are available in five strengths, too. All the way down from 2 MGs, 2 milligrams, to 12 milligrams. 12 milligrams is a heavy hitter. If you're a big dog, you can take the 12 MGs. Go do it. That's big. They also have 12 different flavors. Cinnamon, mint, mango, wintergreen, pomegranate, apple, ice, and espresso. My favorite happens to be uh, the apple ice right now. I do like that. It's cool and smooth and a little bit sweet. Uh, Lucy's great, man. You can Any time of day, you can use it uh, anywhere. That's what's really wonderful about these things, man. The flavors are very long-lasting. doesn't dry out your mouth like some of the competitive pouches. I've tried. Uh, they are very, very good. Uh, whether you use nicotine to focus better, uh, get a boost in energy, or to chill out and relax, however it suits you, Lucy is made for your nicotine routine. If you want to try Lucy's tobacco-free breakers, pouches, or gum, go to lucy.co slash whiskey. Use the promo code whiskey to get 20% off your first order. This stuff is great. Lucy offers free shipping and has a 30-day refund policy. If you change your mind, that's lucy, L-U-C-Y dot C-O, and use code whiskey to get 20% off. And of always, free shipping, all right? Lucy products are only for adults of legal age, and every order is age verified, all right? This product contains nicotine. Warning, it contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical, all right? Ginger. I like gingers. I've done, we've all done this. I've said on this show, the most embarrassing thing, Jim Carrey was my boss and I'm dying up here, and we had dinner, and it was going wonderful. It was like that. It was going wonderful. Yeah. And then I was like, where are you living now? I was like, What? What the fuck am I asking? What, what, where is he living? Like, what? <laughs> a, I, none of my business. Yeah. You know, I'm not coming over. And also, what a moot conversation. Who cares? It's almost like I, there's so many other things we could talk about. And when I asked him where I'm living, he's like, I'm all over the place, man. Which is exactly what he would say. It's yeah. Like, what do you mean? Uh, I'm, I don't know. I don't know. I've, it's it's so funny with Jim Carrey because years ago, Judd Apatow invited me to have lunch in montreal at the festival with jim carrey oh that's cool a few other people it was cool yeah. yeah it's like one of those people it's like he's an all-timer he's a legend yeah and he's the way he's depicted in media because he's in kind of a buddhist headspace he is yeah is that he's kind of loopy like he'll 
like they cl- clip out of context him being like, well, we're all just particles yeah. or whatever. Does anything thing. matter? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. But then it's funny. You talk to him for an hour. You go like, oh yeah, this guy's great. Yeah, this guy's fantastic. Now he's wonderful. Yeah, but also that is true to the conversation. He will say things to the effect of like, um. What does this mean to you? Type of stuff. <laughs> yeah, you know I mean, like it it, it kind of ground it grounds you a little bit in the idea that uh, yeah, because I, I think I did like me, I got lost. Thermos. More more stuff, more drink. What is that, by the way? This is just tea with honey for my voice. Because you're yeah yeah because I've had like this weird. Don't do it. Don't get into a conspiracy theory. Thing. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. You know he's about to do it. <laughs> His new special. What would it even be? What's been in my throat? <laughs> You gotta see Mike's new show. What's oh my been in god, my throat. Jesus Christ! It was a one year, a one year he took to make it, and he yeah. put it all together. That I will say, what that is one of the funny things about being a comedian is the absurdity of getting to occasionally meet or cross paths with people who you've watched for years. Yeah, it's absurd. Yeah, it's it. Yeah. You feel like it shouldn't have happened in a weird like. Yeah. Why did I get to do? Why did we do this? Yeah, and then that's the luck part of it, I guess. Right, but have you? Well, what's weird for me is as a sports fan, I meet athletes and their kids. No. Oh. And I forget I'm forty. Right. And I meet someone who to me is like a god of their of their yes. abilities, and I'm like, yes. this person's so incredibly talented, and they are. But then you meet them and you're like, you're 24. Yeah, you know, you know what's a so great doc. You know what's a great documentary for that is Breakpoint. It's oh, a Breakpoint. tennis documentary. There's like six or ten episodes on Netflix. Wait, I feel like I saw one of these on the oh, plane. That's great. Yeah, it's like they follow Alcaraz and they follow Ans Jabeur and like a handful of these top twenty players. And I don't know how the hell they got this kind of access to the tennis players because they're going in their hotel rooms and they're going on their planes and all this kind of stuff. And you just realize, like, th- these people, even, they're the most, they're the best in the world at a sport, at a sport that a lot of people play. Yeah. Lots. And there's a lot of access to this game. <laughs> right, right. It's everywhere. <laughs> yeah. It's like basketball. Yeah. It's like there's a lot of tennis there's courts, a, a lot of basketball yeah. courts. And yet, their lives are hard. Hard, yeah. I mean, it is constant drills, constant travel, constant press. Yeah. And, you just go, and honestly, like, you get the sense of, like, I mean, I don't know what the hard numbers are on it. But you get the sense that if you're not in the top 15, you're struggling financially. Oh, yeah. I'm not the top, top 15 in the world. The world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> At a sport that a lot of people play. <laughs> if you're, you're 30 in the world and you're not killing it financially? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, what the hell's wrong? It is true. That's so funny. That's the same thing. I'm a big golf guy. If you're like, you're one of the best 50 in the world, doesn't mean that you're financially well off. No. And you're in the world, in the globe. You're one of the greatest who gets to be on the tour and you still aren't making enough money unless you get a win. Unless you win, then you get a good check. But otherwise, you're just kind of coasting through. And also, one of the things is that like the American athletes actually do a lot better financially than yeah than European because the marketplace because because if you're from if you're from Sierra Leone or wherever what's the market share of right. those fans yeah that's true whereas if you're Tiafo in America and it's like you're like he's number eight or six or whatever it's like people are like yeah we love you know but if right. you're number eight and you know you're from Kenya like how many fans do you really have <laughs> right, right. who are going to be we buying the, the rackets, yeah, the yeah. rackets and the shoes right. that have your name on them? Right. Well, that's why guys go to, that's why in a lot of sports they end up going to you know, uh to China or 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 uh Eastern Europe to play ball or something like that because there's a whole other career to be had if you can't have one here, there's something else to be had over there. That's something to be said about the American market too. That's like once Americans are very harsh when we're done with you we're done. <laughs> and that, a, same thing in by our By the game. way, art, art, entertainment same, too. I talk about thing. this with Gaffigan. When we're done. They're done. With I talk you. about this with Gaffigan. Is like he's like I've been doing this for thirty years. He's like I'm so lucky. Yeah. He's like this business spits people out. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, people think about how many people you came up with or I came up with 
They're just gone. Where are they? Yeah, so they're ghosts. They're floating through the hallways. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. Well, it's like, and I, and the, my only fear is, um, what I think you've done, and I do want to say this to you, as someone who's really loved what you've done since I've known, since I've seen you, um, you, you, you've made your own path, which is extremely difficult. And I give you a lot of credit for that oh, because thanks, man. you've created your own world and you know, like all of us have learned, um, no one's, uh, the phone's not ringing, whatever, you know, this right. like, oh my gosh, the no, phone is not it, ringing. It's not like, uh, Mike, you're going to get it all. And you're like, we're going to get it all. Like it, you have to make it. Otherwise it doesn't happen. I, whether people think that there's something behind it machine wise, there's, I'm, the truth is you did it. Yes, people were there to help make the dream come to reality, but you have to build all of it from zero. Like, you have to do it. And if you stop, they're not going to, like, you know, be there to catch you. So, thankfully, I guess my point is this career only continues if you do the burpees. You got to do the burpees. And you just keep doing the burpees. But you know what was a, a major thing, a major inflection point? And thanks for the compliment. At the end, at the end you go, but... But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I would like some more tags on the jokes. Yeah. I feel like they just end. In the last, is special, that the whole there joke? There was a bit I did not like. <laughs> yeah. My mother was hurt by. Yeah, did uh, not enjoy. Did not enjoy. <laughs> no, no. I uh, I had a big inflection point where I moved out here for a couple months in 2008, and. I was, it was the dream come true. It was my former dream come true, which is sitcom pilot at CBS. And Bob Odenkirk was my brother. We shot it. Bob Odenkirk played my brother. Francis Conroy played my mom. Nick Kroll played my cousin. I mean, Whoa. My, the Mike Birbiglia, untitled Mike Birbiglia project, literally called that before the Mindy project, whatever. And it was, it was all right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, it was all right. <clears throat> like, it was all right. I'm sure it was passable. Yeah. I mean, it was, to me, and it didn't go to series. Um, and it was the luckiest thing that ever happened in my career, other than, like, ten other things of, along the way. But like, but, like, in some ways, it was the luckiest thing that ever happened to me because if it was death by a thousand cuts artistically, it was like you get the notes, and then you make it a little more broad. And then you get more notes, you make it a little more broad. And you're yeah. like... Yeah, but once we get it on the air, then we can have fun, whatever. And by the time that we finish it, it was like, it doesn't even have to be me. It could be anybody. Yeah, I hate that. You know? Yeah. And so then I had been working on my solo show, Sleepwalk with me, for probably three, four years. At this point, I was writing it. And and I'd been working with this guy, this director, Seth Barish, who's a brilliant theater director. And since then, he and I have done five shows together. And... uh and I, I, my takeaway from Los Angeles, from Hollywood, seeing a CBS uh, group of executives and producers and crew put something together is like, oh, wow, Hollywood is really good at uh, marketing something and putting a shine on it mm -hmm. and making it look and feel like a thing. Yeah. What Hollywood isn't good at is doing the thing. Right. And I'm good at doing the thing, yes. and I'm not good at marketing the thing. Yeah. So I went back to New York, and I was like, all right, I'm going to do Sleepwalk with me, but I'm going to do it nice. We'll have a photo shoot. We'll, do a, we'll spend a lot of money and thought and time on producing it properly. We'll get proper designers. We'll get great... I started working with this guy, Beowulf Barrett, who designed all five of my shows. He's won, since then, he's won two Tonys. Like, he's just wow. amazing. And, you know, we'll work with designers. We'll work with lighting designers. We'll, like, make this thing really nice. And and then, you know, we were lucky because then they, Nathan Lane really liked the show. And then he put his name on the show. And, and Nathan Lane presents Mike Birbiglia's Sleepwalk with me. And then all of a sudden it became, like, Oh yeah, I don't need the Hollywood machine. I can just be the thing myself. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's a, a lot more work, but that's the cost of admission for this path. Yeah, worth it. Yeah, worth it. Well worth it. Yeah, I think so. But that's the burpees. That's the thing you talk about. That's the like, burpees. Yeah. The, the talent was making was having the idea. It's hilarious the, talking about burpees because I can't do burpees. Neither can I. <laughs>
<laughs> Who does? I can't. Does anybody really do that? I can't. Yeah. It's an insane. When I see people online doing stuff like that, I'm always like, oh, shut up. It's, uh, whenever I see someone doing like really grueling exercises online, I, it really pisses me off because I don't, just don't have the athleticism to do it anymore. And I'm just like, oh, you're just showing off. There's this Sondheim show in New York that Mulaney and I went to see the other day. And it was, uh, and it's a really fun, funny show. But there's a character who does burpees in the show. In the show? And he does them for like five minutes straight. Wow. Hot and guy, I said huh? to him backstage, Real the actor guy. afterwards, I go like, you do the burpee. You're really fucking doing them. You know, if people don't know what this is, it's like a push up and then like a, you hop up. and It's then a jump, hop, down, jump. push up. Yeah, yeah, there you are. Yeah. <laughs> and he goes, I made the mistake of do improvising that in rehearsal. Idiot. And they're like, let's keep that. <laughs> no, idiot. <laughs> <laughs> That's an old, that is one of those old rules that like, uh, oh, uh, Robert Forrester did the pilot for the show that I did and <laughs> we were sitting at a table and he kind of came up to me and was like, are you guys going to smoke that joint the whole time? Oh my God. And I was like, uh, I mean, we can, we can't, you know, whatever. And he's like, well, you're going to be doing that all day. Yes. Smart. And I was like, smart. Right. Right. And he goes, I'm just saying. And then he walked away because we didn't have to be smoking a joint. Someone in the group was like, oh, yeah, we should be passing around a joint while we're listening to him do this, like, really intense speech about how much yeah. dis how much disrespect we've shown to his family. And I thought, man, that's great because I didn't want to have to suck on that thing for fucking nine hours. It was a huge scene. So, thankfully, he kind of gave that's a That's a super smart one. Yeah, he was like, don't, you don't want to smoke that. You're going to be sitting smoking in this because it was a eating is scene. Eating is the same. Eating is the way. Any eating scene, you got to spit into the thing. You, know what you I always can't say? eat the thing. When, when a director goes, I do like to see, uh, uh, this director came on our show and she goes, I don't want fake eating. Yeah. I don't want to see fake eating. I hate it. And she comes up to me and she goes, well, what's going on here? I go, I've already finished. <laughs> and she was like, okay. <laughs> She goes, all right, gave me credit for it. She's like, all right. I go, I eat fast in real life. And yeah. I, these guys are more than halfway done. I've already finished my plate. I was like, I'll just sip out of a cup. Because I couldn't stand, I never liked eating on camera, but I also hated, and to her credit, she's right, I hated to see people fake eating on TV. Yeah. It bothers me no, to know. I get it. it. I get it's it. It's so weird looking. You're like, eat it. Don't, nobody moves it around that much in conversation. I feel that way about sex scenes. Oh, they're always so weird. Always so bad. So bad and weird and uncomfortable. Oh, they're terrible. I don't like, dude, I do not like seeing sex scenes. Oh. It's like, it, it makes me curl up inside. It doesn't look anything like sex. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It doesn't. What's happening? What are you doing? Yeah, it's also so, it's like, um, you could, but if you showed the, the awkwardness of real sex. Yes. It would be really, it's almost like porn. Porn is so uh, is so choreographed that you're like, man. If there was a real porn of yeah. like awkward couples sex, yeah, it would be it would be a drama. It would one, be sad. One, time I, one time I was in my hotel room in Denver, Colorado, and I and I look out my window and across the way, across the street, I see a lit up hotel room mm -hmm. with two people having sex, Love like. It. People do in porn. Yeah. <laughs> and it was fully lit up. They they must have known that they did it was. Know. Yeah, 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 they know. Right? They do it for you. They did it for me. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, and this position, and this position, <laughs> yeah. and this. And they're both in shape. And it's like, it was this weird thing where I go like, wait, are they mimicking porn or is porn based on them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should do that as a bet. That's a great bit. Because uh, I, 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 I always I have think the about scene it. of you being like, come on. And they keep switching. <laughs> come on. <laughs> also, at the very end, you take one sip of coffee and you're like, God damn, this is good coffee. It just wipes away this entire sex scene that you've seen. I've seen this in hotels, people having sex. New York is probably my favorite place yeah. to watch people have sex. You, every time I'm in New York at a nice hotel, yeah. I always see someone having sex. Oh, that's interesting. Always. I always see someone in one of the windows having sex. And they do this because that voyeuristic thing is awesome because they don't have to ever There's see no you. There's no stakes. Yeah. Very low stakes having Yeah, you get to see me without ever knowing a, you. in a city with a lit up window. It's awesome. Yeah. I have you dare. done it? I don't dare. No, nah, me you neither. Are you me? Yeah, yeah. Out of my mind? Yeah. My, wi my wife doesn't want to... Uh, Curtains close, lights off. She doesn't want to see me. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. It's it's all but wearing costumes. We're right there. We might start wearing costumes, so we completely disappear. 
I can't. Yeah. If I had someone else seeing me having sex in a public space like that, I the other mm-mm. day, end of times. Today, Jen texted me a photo of me on Halloween dressed up as Colonel Mustard Stains, which is Colonel <laughs> Mustard with actual mustard stains <laughs> that my daughter, my daughter, rubbed into the thing, and uh, she sent me a photo, and I. I wrote back, who would marry this person? <laughs> I feel like that all the time. Yeah. I'm always just like. What fool. Yeah. You really this. got stuck with this guy. Yeah. <laughs> you got a lemon. You married yeah, yeah, a lemon. You got a lemon. Yeah. You, you married a lemon. a lemon. Yeah. But isn't it relieving to know that uh, you can be Colonel Mustard Stains and she thinks it's fun? Oh, she she likes it. Thank God. Think about putting oh, that on she, a dating app. No. Oh, my God. <laughs> no, I think I, you know. I I've, I've I've been tinkering with this at the cellar lately, but it's like, um, I go if you if you meet someone in your life who understands you more than anyone in the world, and that person is willing to spend any meaningful amount of time with you at all, you are very lucky. Yeah. And then I go. That being said, <laughs> and then I go into like a handful of things, like on a regular basis, Jen will stare at me doing an activity for like five seconds, and then go like, "What are you doing?" Yeah. And it'll be about, like, there's, like, ten different things. Like, what are you doing is a big part of our lives. What are you doing? Yeah, what are you doing? Yeah, I do that to myself a lot. I go, what am I What am I doing? If yeah. I feel like I'm wasting time doing anything, I'm always like, what the, what the fuck am I doing? We do a thing now where, I don't know if you tell me if you do this, where I don't mean to raise my voice, but yeah. I'll say it out of frustration with a little bit of... Yeah. And she'll be like, what was that? And then I immediately have to be like... Nothing. I don't. I'm just saying. Right. Uh, and I have yeah, to go yeah, back yeah, to yeah. the voice. Pitch. Business voice. Business right. voice. No, I'm just saying. No, I was saying no. I, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> such no, no, I was not. I, I, I think actually, absolutely, we should go. <laughs> yeah. No, we should. No, we should be late. We should. We should go at nine thirty. Even though the invitation said seven, I think nine thirty is a good time to show up. I was agreeing. Yeah, we should get. We should prepare for the party for about five six hours. I think that's a good idea. <laughs> Business voice. Business voice. Yeah, yeah. Business voice. Hey, I was saying, uh, hey, that, that, this is Mike Birbiglia. I'm just, uh, I'm in room 317, and uh, I was just thinking, uh, maybe, uh, if there could be ice, like the, the ice maker doesn't <laughs> make ice. <laughs> also, I need medical. If you could send someone immediately, I do need medical. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, uh, uh, God darn it. Gosh darn it. Uh, uh, thumb, anyway. No, okay. I thought you were going. I thought no, you were going I had, somewhere. I had something that went away. I have to ask you real fast. The bracelets. Is this from your kid? Yeah, this is Una made this. It's this. Uh, this is your version of uh, letting letting a lot of dads now let the daughters paint their nails. Have you seen this? I've done that. Yeah, this yeah, is a, this I is a hot this is a hot bed now. Yeah, yeah. But your daughter made this these one for said you. Silly, and this other one says Una Dad, which is based on a a poem that my wife Jenny wrote. Um, my wife's a poet. Yeah. And uh, J- she writes under J Hope Stein, and uh, and she wrote a poem called Una Dad that's really beautiful. And and she made that for you. Yeah, and Una made this, and then she is silly. She goes, Dad, it's to remind you to be silly. Oh, that's fucking. Yeah, weird. yeah. I don't want to get you emotional. You're gonna see her soon. It's okay. <sighs> I know. You're I gonna know. see. You're gonna see them soon. When when you're on the flight back, uh, the excitement to see your loved ones. Yeah. It r- only really hits when you start your descent. You know what I mean? Like the whole flight. This kind of like trudging through this, like, come on, let's get to the fucking place. I'm exhausted. I don't know how to do yeah. And then as soon as they're like, and we're starting our ascent, that's when like my endorphins kick in. I'm like, oh, yeah. finally I get to go home, home. Yes. Because as much as we travel, I kind of lose track of all the, you know, I feel a little spacey, especially lately. We've been on such a big tour. Like, do you feel that when you kind of lose sense? It's funny. Like, I said to Noam, who owns the comedy cellar recently, yeah. I go, there's, the, if you're lucky, I feel like, there's a there's a place where you roughly feel at home, which means you feel warm there. You feel like you're among people who you love and love you. And for me, it's literally it's my apartment in New York with my wife and daughter, and it's the comedy cellar. Those are the right two places. Yeah, I mean, w- one of them is a bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Formerly a bar. Yeah. <laughs> Formerly a bar. Yeah, yeah, it is. But no, it's true. Do you? What are your? Do you have two homes? Or one home or two homes? Or like, what? what's your home? Well, it's funny that you say that, and I hate to say this, but uh, the store was my home club, is my home club. Yeah. And it used to feel that way the most. Yeah. And it's gotten, 
it's changed a lot because the city changed a lot. Pandemic yeah. changed the city a lot. A lot of people moved and left. And yeah. It shifted so heavily that it doesn't feel the way it used to. And now it's mothership. No, it's the mother. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, it just feels like uh, the store, uh, even without people leaving, the pandemic shifted the culture. And it. we had like kind of a big uh, upending here. And a lot of young people came up, came in, which is great. But True it, New York, too. It, it a lot just of young feels people. Different. It's great. It just feels a little bit different. But home, home, truly for me, uh, uh, yeah, at my physical house, I would say, and then the moment I go back to Chicago... Uh, you do feel like that in Chicago. God, yeah. I love Chicago. That's nice. I love it so much. I just wish I wish I could be there, but I can't. Is that where you started doing comedy in Chicago? No. I mean, okay. I, 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 I here. really started here, truthfully, you know? Yeah. Uh, but Chicago just home to me, man. I don't know. I It is literally home, but also I really adore that city. I love it there. I just like the people. Yeah. Uh, it's the guts of it all is is great. Everyone is a hustler. I love that. Yeah. Everyone's a hustler. Everyone's oh, it's incredible up to city. something. Where New York is like is so many people with so much going on that you can't really define New York. It's 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 a, it's a, it is a breathing living thing. Yeah. Chicago is pretty definable. Like you go to Chicago, you know a Chicago person when you see one. You're like oh, that's that guy's from Chicago. Well, it's and even you're from Naperville. Yeah. <clears throat> which yeah. is in Don't Think Twice, it's name checked because oh, it is my character, which is named Miles, which is loosely based on my friend Chris Fosdick, who lives in Naperville with his wife and family. Oh, that's wild! And um, that's he, how you got it. He was well. He was yeah. At the end of the movie, he goes back to Naperville. Oh wow! Which is like you know where his where his girlfriend is, is, who's having a baby is. Uh, Living, living the suburb life. Yeah, yeah. Naperville. Naperville. Yeah, that's a, yeah. and that's literally from my friend Chris Fazek, who's, <clears throat> excuse me, who was from, um, who cast me in my college improv troupe, which changed my life, right, and uh, forever. I mean, truly forever changed because those before that, I was like, I don't really feel like I connect with anybody, and then I met these ten people, and that was and, it. And I was like, oh, this is great. This is, I just got to meet people like this. Yeah. Like, com- com- comedians are the best. Uh-huh. Well, and I had never met one. Right, exactly. That, yeah. It's a mixed bag also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but uh, yeah, that's what I found out later. But, but then Chris was, I, and, and then we moved to, uh, we all kind of moved to New York, including, like, Nick Kroll was in that group. And, like, it was, like, a really good group. We were called Little Man. We used to perform at UCB Theater. And then at a certain point, the people started to sort of break off and do different things. Right. And, and uh and then Chris moved back to Naperville with with his wife, and maybe he got married. Did you ask him about that before you put it in the film? No, but he and I have like we're so close. Like I feel like we have a shorthand. Sure. About like he knows how I feel about the whole thing. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I said to him, I go like because he was. <clears throat> I mean, Nick Roll might dispute this, but he, I think he was the best improviser. In I don't the crew. listen to a word Nick Roll says. <laughs> Take Nick Kroll. Well, Nick, was, Nick yeah. was always amazing. Nick yeah. was Nick auditioned for our Georgetown Improv Group, and I and I had to convince the other people, the producers. I was the director. I had to be, I had to be like, we have to cast this guy. And they were like, yeah, but this and this, and we like this other person. Is it because he was young or something? Or? No, it was like he was just kind of like Nick is, which is like kind of nuts. Yeah. And like, <laughs> yeah. and I was like, and like maybe not as refined. Like he hadn't done a lot of like, he hadn't been an actor. He hadn't done a lot of, he hadn't put in the hours. And so yeah. it was like this kind of like rougher version of Nick Kroll, but he was so funny in his bones. And I just said to the rest of the group, I go like, no, no, no. This guy's funny in his bones. Right, it's, this, it's there. This is this is one of the funniest people I've ever seen. I don't even know him. Right, and and then uh, and then he became what he became. But like, but uh, but yeah, Chris Fosdick was. I I, I think we all kind of thought he was the best improviser in the, the group. And then and then he went <clears throat> until live in Naperville. And I said to him, I go like, I one night after one of our shows at UCB, I said to him at the bar, I go like. You shouldn't leave. We're all gonna make it. We're all gonna have careers. And he goes, "Yeah, but I look around this bar at the people who have careers, and I just don't want it." Well, I like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> he's the best. No, he's, really he's like, like literally the he's best. He's right. What does he do now? Do you know? He works in consulting, and uh, he's doing he, great. He's like a partner at some firm. Yeah. I won't even say the name. But no, no, like, no. But smart guy. 
He, oh yeah, you know, and he's 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 salt of the earth. He's like, <laughs> I look around. I don't want to be any of these. I don't want to be any of these people. <laughs> I don't want to be these miserable he'll assholes. Love, and he'll love this, by the way. Yeah, like he'll he'll send this around. But I get it. It is the the western suburb of Chicago is kind of this weird metaphor for like. Um, it's like a yeah, it's like a weird safety net, and it's also a nice. People go there when when all the people start to have kids, they move there. Like when me and my mom lived in the city when I was a kid, and then when she had my sister, yeah, we left the city because yeah. she wanted to raise my sister not in the city because I was a fucking lunatic. Yeah, you know because I came from a broken marriage and then a kid grown up in the city, and my mom was like, "I'm not doing this twice." Oh wow! So when we went to the western suburbs, it was kind of like you mean that your parents had broken up. My parents got divorced when I was one. When you were one, okay. So my mom raised me. Then she met my stepdad, and who became my my father, who raised me. Yeah. And when they got pregnant, my mom was like, "We got to get, we can't raise one in, another one in the city." Yeah. That was always the joke. I was like, "You really loved her," because me, they were fine being like, "Take a walk, go to the fucking White Hen by yourself." Right. It was like it, there was the. What walk, do you mean you really loved her? They, no, they. that was like, you must really love the one that you didn't want to raise downtown. Oh, For me, yeah, it was yeah. like, they let me wander. I mean, I could do, I felt free to kind of like, Interesting. you know, the city was kind of this like fun little playground of chaos yeah. that I could get into. Uh, but I think they wanted to protect her. And the Western suburbs was like a nice, was nice. It's like, we got to get away from the city. Yeah. So that's why I say you really loved her. For me, it was like, oh, we fucked this one up. We should fix this one. <laughs> right. We should make this one the You're right You're the first one. batch of pancakes. Yeah, it's not. they're not that good. And one then, side is And burnt. then your sister is the second batch of pancakes. Right, they're so fluffy. Yeah, yeah. nice. But they can't drive on the highway. <laughs> 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 that's the exchange. Keep those pancakes away from the highway. That's right. Keep yeah, those fluffy yeah. pancakes away from the highway and very scary movies. She's going to hate that I said that. I can drive on the fucking highway. Oh, that was always the biggest joke was she was scared of chaos. But I liked it because yeah. like the first time I went to New York, I remember being like, this is Chicago on steroids. This is what I, by the way, this is what I disagree with about with Seinfeld. His, you know, in interviews. Well, let's get started about stuff like this. I disagree with so much about Seinfeld. Let me tell you something, fucking Jerry. No, go no, ahead. No. <laughs> no. He, in interviews, people will often ask him, like, are comedians broken or the hair? Of he goes, no. He goes, any profession, you go in and, you know, there's people, yeah, everyone's broken in some way. And I think that comedians are particularly broken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I yeah. mean, the fact that you're like, divorced from the one and then they, we move from this and, you know. Yeah, we're broken. Yeah. There's a reason you're a comedian. A hundred percent. Yeah. The life had to make you funny uh, to deal with. Yeah, to cope. It's a coping weird, mechanism. Weird shit. I always yeah. say with Old Man in the Pool, it's like, I always say that like, I talk about death for basically 90 minutes because that was my goal. My goal was I'm anxious about death. I'm sad when I think about losing people close to me. Yeah. How can I make this funny? Because everybody's experiencing this to some degree. How can I make this funny for them? Yeah. How can I use my coping mechanism and give it to them? And maybe it's helpful for them. How old were you again when your old man passed? No, no. My dad's still alive. He's 83. My, po my folks are 83. But he's had a handful of heart attacks. Like, it's been, it's been like touching nerves. It keeps going. Yes, yeah, since he was 56. Yeah, yeah. You haven't had one. No. Knock on that, knock on that, knock on that, knock on that. That, this part's wood. There you go. That's wood, too. Um, no. I, but I've just had so many health scares. Like, I had jumped through a second-story window sleepwalking and, uh, you know, whatever. Yeah, it's like That one's worth it, though. It made a great show. <laughs> <laughs> if it makes a good that show, it makes a good show. That one's worth it, though. <laughs> you, know I mean? you know, I'm going back to Walla Walla. Really? To where I jumped through the window. At the, at La Quinta Inn is where I Why? 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 This Why? Is Why what, are you going if people don't know, this is what I'm, a movie and show called Sleepwalking is based on. I'm just, I thought it would be funny if I went back 20 years later. I don't know, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Mike. I don't know if this is a good idea, man. I'm not going to stay at La Quinta Inn. No, let's not stay there. There's a plaque on the wall there. Um, there's a plaque on the wall that says, uh, 20 years ago, you know, Mike Birbiglia, comedian Mike Birbiglia, it's jumped so through a second. And some of my fans, like, will go as, like, a pilgrimage, like, but they think it's funny, which I, I do. I think it's, it's like funny Lenin's too. grave. This is like your, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they put flowers by that La Quinta Inn. But I'm, yeah, no, there's a, there's a gorgeous little like 400 seater there and 400 seat theater. And so I'm doing that and Seattle, Portland, and like Vancouver. Like I'm just doing a Pacific Northwest I run. I love the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, it's gorgeous. So nice. It's gorgeous. And like, and I'm doing that in January. 
uh, which is a beautiful time of year for that part of the country. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, hey, man, it's not uh, Minneapolis. You know what I mean? Oh, my gosh. I've Ice done, cold in the winter. I nothing make, worse. I make those... How about Minneapolis when you tour there in the winter and there's fucking tubing in between the buildings yeah. because you physically can't walk outside? No, nah, man. Yeah. I mean, it's what funny. is happening in well, that city? This guy's from there. He knows. Oh, that's they're where crazy. you're from? They're all kind of crazy in a great way. They're great Midwest they're, crazy. They're funny people. Yeah, I mean, very... Mitch Hedberg, Maria Bamford, Bob Dylan. Like, yes. it's endless the amount of talent. Yeah, great musicians and comics out of there. Well, yeah, Prince. I mean, yeah. it's like the amount of talent. And it's not a... Co- coincidence no it's not a coincidence that like massachusetts has a lot of comedians yeah. you know chicago, chicago has, a has a lot of, lot of comedians. comedians minneapolis yeah. has a lot of comedians like like i don't know i don't want to like be do it do it do i don't want to be it. offensive to people who live like i just don't see a lot of comedians coming out of hawaii <laughs> <laughs> It's not the comedy scene's not <laughs> popping off in Hawaii. You don't see that often. Aruba do you? Yeah. is not yielding enough it's not, comedians. Not a lot of comics out of the Caribbean, huh? No, no, it's not happening, is if it? If it's really nice, it's what's t- to yeah. what's to get down about? What's the bummer? What's the bummer, man? Well, and where's the coping? You don't have the coping isn't there. You don't get that coping skill. Not a lot of comics out of Hawaii. It's true, right? It's so true. It's bananas. Do you have any? Uh, want to make this special a film you know i've I've outlined it as a film you know because i um the producer one of the producers of uh don't think twice was like this should be a film and and i and i was like yeah i know what you mean because i structure my shows like film stories they're plays you know but I, it's this tricky thing where I did Sleepwalk With Me as a solo show, and then I did it as a movie. And there was some part of me when I was making the movie where I'm like, I've told this story for years, and then yeah. I'm I'm doing it again. And so there is some degree of, like, you, you want to move on to the next thing. And I'm writing another movie that's completely separate, and I'm writing the to- what I'm touring now, you know, uh, like I said, to Walla Walla and Seattle and all these places, Boston. Um uh, which is called Please Stop the Ride, which I'm super psyched about, which is all about, like, Please Stop the Ride is in reference to, like, going to a carnival when I was a kid and when I was in seventh grade and, and like, being with a girl I have a crush on and knowing I'm going to throw up on the ride, on the scrambler, and just being like, I got to tell the guy to stop the ride. I got to tell the guy to stop the ride. And then I would go, please stop the ride. And then you're back, and then you're scrambling, scrambling, scrambling. Please stop the ride! And then you're scrambling, scrambling, scrambling. And it's, like, really about, like, and the show is, it's not done yet and it's the early stages, but it's like that, it's that thing of like, of you, at a certain point, you realize, like, oh, yeah, we're all on the ride. Yeah. And it's not going to stop. No. And, and, and you have to just figure out how to enjoy the ride. That's right. Or what does your wife say? Watch, oh, your, own watch your own show. Watch your own show. <laughs> <laughs> I think she said it in an even wittier way. She goes, like, I have a show to recommend to you. Yeah, you know what you should really... <laughs> you know what me and my friends really enjoy? Uh, well, please go watch your own show. Please go watch uh, Mike's sh- Mike special. It's out right now. Um, and it's... Uh, it's Are you be wrapping up? Banger. Yeah. You're wrapping up? Okay. I want to kick you out of here. Well, you know I, why? You know why? Because you've got to catch a flight. I know, i got to catch a flight. I don't want to make you more Oh, yeah. Late. Good catch. Um, the uh, And I want to get you to New York... Yeah, uh, to be on working it out. And I'll, wor- be there work in, out jokes. I'll be there in one month. I'm going to come poke around. Because we literally, like Pete Holmes has been on. He's coming on for the third time this month. That's too many to be honest. With you. <laughs> yeah, let's get Pete on there a little bit less. Yeah. <laughs> but like we actually work out jokes. Like there's jokes in his special which I love, um, where I tagged his joke. You know, he's t- he tagged jokes that are that are in the old man in the pool. Like we literally the things that we do at the store in the cellar where we're like, hey, have you ever thought about this? Yeah, like, we do it on the podcast. It's super fun. But it's only fun to hear from someone you really like. <laughs> It's true. You know when somebody comes up to you, they go, Mike, Mike. Oh. And then you're like, ah, fuck this guy. I hate this fucking guy. And yeah, you have to be nice. Worst. Yes, they thank pit, you. They pitch you like the version of it that's much worse. Than Way worse. You. Or you're like, uh, yeah, dude, do you like that? You like the pitch you did? Are you just doing that because you wanted to talk? We could just talk. We could just chat. You don't have to just give yeah. me a bad tag. No, just no, Just say no. hey. No, I totally agree. I don't like that. It's got to be I, a buddy. It's got to be a buddy. I would never give someone a tag unless they're. We have a pre-established relationship of 
this is kind of a thing. Thank you for all the coffees. Yeah, please. Thank you for all the coffees. Please. Um, it's our pleasure. Andrew, thanks for having me on. Thank you for being this here. Is super fun. Uh, please go watch a special now on on, uh, on Netflix. On Netflix. Cut out, um, please cut out all the things of me with my no, big no. crazy thermos. Zoom in on, the, on Tim drinking the thermos right now. Thank you. It's tea. Yeah. Just so people know, it's sure tea, it and this is a normal thing to do. Sure it is. To drink tea uh, from a thermos. We end the show the same way, Mike. Uh, you look in that camera right there. You're single. Yeah. Um, and you say one word or one phrase uh, to end the episode. I like it as a little button to for you to, you know, have your last word or words. New friendship. In here, we pour whisk, 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 whisk. Oh, that creature in the ginger beard. Sturdy and ginger. Like vampires, the ginger gene is a curse. Gingers are beautiful. You owe me five dollars for the whiskey and seventy-five dollars for the horse. Gingers are oh, hell no. This whiskey is excellent. Ginger. I like gingers.